grab our Bibles. We are in the book of Revelation this morning, as we will be for the forecoming future. We uh, turn to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 9 through 15 this morning. Church, when you find this passage, let's go ahead and stand up together for the reading of God's Word as we all recognize here at this church that God's Word is inspired and inerrant. It is the infallible Word of the true and living God. Revelation chapter 1, let's listen to verses 9 through 15 this morning. Hear now the Word of our God to us. He writes, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, And the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one, like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. So the action picks up quite intensely now in this text in Revelation chapter 1. Um, We've already looked at a brief introduction, the prologue to this particular book. And last week we looked at what we might call the epistolary greeting as John does greet the seven churches who are addressed here again in our text before us this morning. And in this particular passage that we're looking at, these short verses together, John is not only going to mention his own suffering that he is now experiencing as a faithful proclaimer of the Word of God. We're introduced a little bit more now to John's own circumstances and his condition in which he is writing, but we're also going to now begin to see the first glimpse of John's apocalyptic vision, this theophanic epiphany, this theophany, this Christophany of Jesus Christ, as he sees this glorious vision of the raised and ascended Christ, which is easily going to overshadow every other vision throughout the entire book. This is, we might say, the high point on which the book of Revelation Begins And so we're going to this morning really just attempt to do two things. I hope you have your Bible out and following along with me as we work through this text. We're going to be mostly working through this verse by verse and line by line here in verses 9 through 15. But I want to try to cover at least two major categories of teaching this morning. First of all, we're going to look at John's own suffering as a martyr. So that'll be the first thing that we look at. Uh, Remember from last week that the word martyr does not necessarily mean one who dies for the sake of the gospel, though that very often is included in the language of one who is a martyr, but technically speaking, a martyr is simply one who has witnessed something and is now being called to give testimony to that very thing. And so John is going to serve as a martyr. He is going to suffer for the sake of the gospel. We're going to see that in our passage this morning. So first, we're going to look at his sufferings as a martyr. And then secondly, we're going to turn our attention then to what John sees, his vision as a seer, that is to say, one who sees. He has a vision that's laid before his eyes and his ears this morning, and we're going to have a look at that, and we're going to pull in several verses with that vision and also spill into next week as well. We're going to continue looking at this vision as David will pick up next week with verses 16 through 20. So again, I hope you have your Bible open with you as we go through this. First of all, John's sufferings as a martyr. Look at verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Now, John begins to introduce himself here as though he were not already well known. And I want you to, to just notice how modest and how humble and how gracious John is in his own self introduction here. What does he call himself? He simply calls himself your brother and your partner in the tribulation. Now, if there was anybody alive on planet Earth at this particular time who could boast rightly 
and call himself by exalted names, titles, and phrases, you might think that it would be the Apostle John. He is, after all, an apostle, and there are only 12, right, of Jesus' main 12 apostolic band of, of testifying disciples with apostolic authority within the church. John is one of them. He does not introduce himself here as an apostle, though he surely could have. Neither does he introduce himself as the one who is called to Jesus by the seashore, although he could have done that. John could have introduced himself as the only brave disciple who actually stood near the cross when Jesus died. Remember, all of the others of the apostles, they scattered like cowards, except for John and Mary and a few of the women. John is the one disciple who is brave enough to stand there by the cross. He could have reminded the churches of these things, and he does not. John could have boasted here that he is one called in the Gospels, the beloved disciple. But he doesn't use that phrase here. John could have bragged that he beat Peter in a foot race to the empty tomb, and he was the one disciple, well, at least the first one, let's say, to get to, to the tomb and actually look inside and see the fact with his own eyes that Jesus had been raised from the dead. John has certainly reason enough to boast In his self-introduction here, he could have said, listen, I am the foremost of the living apostles left on planet earth. Many many of them had already died. And some of them had already been executed for the sake of the gospel, as far as we know, by this point. And yet John does not introduce himself with any of these terms. What does he call himself here? He says, I am your brother and I am your partner. Why? Because tribulation is upon the church. And when the church begins to suffer, when the church begins to go through tribulations, your resume no longer has any relevance here. We are all exactly on on equal footing before the cross, and we are all on exactly equal footing when tribulation comes upon the church. Tribulation and hardship and persecution of the church has a way of cutting down anyone's ego if they had one at all in the first place. And so John simply says here, I am writing to you, uh, not from any particular position of of, of high exaltation, but simply as your brother and your partner in the sufferings that we are together going to be enduring as the church. Now I want you to notice here this word tribulation there in verse 9. The word tribulation does tend to take on sort of a technical connotation at times in people's theology, especially when it comes to eschatology. But I want to just offer you a word of caution here about the word tribulation. There are certain schools of eschatology in which the word tribulation seems to take on this sort of nuance related to the last seven years of hardship before the return of Christ, right? We think of our dispensational friends and brothers here. They tend to speak of the great tribulation as as though there are only seven years of tribulation. Not all of them do that, but sometimes they speak of the great tribulation in that kind of a way with a very specialized connotation of just seven years. Now, I understand, of course, that prophecy has sort of a telescoping effect, and I certainly do not deny that tribulation may be worse as we approach the return of Christ. I just simply want to offer you this one word of caution here. When we look at the word tribulation, please be mindful that it is not some sort of distant suffering that uh, we're waiting to experience at some undefined point in the future, but rather that tribulation is sort of the status quo for the church in this world. We, We are constantly called to suffer for Christ. This is not something that's out there. It's something that John already says that they're experiencing. Look again at verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation. John and the church are already experiencing tribulation in the first century. Everybody with me on that? Okay, it's, it's already present, and he's going to warn them again in chapter 2, in, in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, when he's writing to the church of Smyrna. He says, I know your tribulation And he speaks of it as though they are currently already experiencing this hardship. And so even the phrase, the great tribulation, which our dispensationalist brothers and sisters, they really pick up on that phrase and they really tend to apply it to those last seven years before Christ returns. The phrase, the great tribulation, is only in the book of Revelation but one time. And I want you to look at it really quickly, quickly, quickly with me here this morning. It is in chapter 7. It's the only time this phrase actually comes up. It's in Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. 
And it says this, I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Now, what is the great tribulation in the context of chapter 7? Well, he's seen in verse 9, just prior, this whole great multitude that no one could number from every nation and all tribes and all peoples and all languages standing before the throne. It's these ones that he is addressing as coming out of the great tribulation. Friends, this, this is not just a seven-year period towards the end, but these elect redeemed saints are those whom Christ has saved for himself throughout the entirety of redemption history. And so this idea of the great tribulation is the common experience that all Christian believers are going to experience together. And John himself has already begun to experience this kind of hardship. All right? How is John experiencing this hardship already? We'll go back to our main text and look at chapter 1, verse 9 again. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos. Pause right there. What is that? Well, you and I, we probably think of uh, islands in connotation with vacations and, and retreats, very expensive ones perhaps. Uh, but the island that he's talking about here is not a vacation trip. John is not sending postcards from, from his luxurious vacation destination here. John is writing to the churches from a position of having been exiled to a prisoner colony. That's what the island of Patmos was in the first century A.D. And this is hardship that John is going through here. He has become a prisoner of the state. They have exiled him for the sake of preaching the gospel. Now, if somebody asks me, uh, when did this happen to John? Well, there are, there are two dates that are commonly discussed related to the, the writing of the book of Revelation, I have to confess to you, I don't know which date is correct. As some scholars will tell you that Revelation was written just prior to 70 A.D., perhaps the year 68 A.D., where Nero is the persecuting Roman emperor. That's a possibility, I grant it. Others will tell you that the book of Revelation was written a little bit later in 95 A.D. under the emperor Domitian. Both Nero and Domitian were known as persecuting emperors. So I, I personally don't know. Maybe I'll figure this out sometime later in the series exactly when John is writing here, though certain scholars certainly have hard and fast opinions on this particular matter. All I can tell you, though, is that there is at least one extra biblical testimony by the church historian Eusebius writing in the 4th century. So this is a little bit late. But Eusebius argues for that later date of 95 AD. He says he has confirmation that John was ex exiled to Patmos in 95 and that he spent about 18 months there. Either way, whether it's 68 under Nero or 95 under Domitian, John is already beginning to become an old man by ancient first century standards. All right? And so the Roman emperor, whoever that is, be it Nero or Domitian, again, we can discuss that later, they saw fit to take this elderly church leader who was probably one of the last living apostles, if not the last living apostle, and they've decided to banish him to an island in which they normally confine the worst of the political state prisoners and other violent offenders. My question to you, why did they see fit to do that to John? Why would they rip away this, this apostolic wise leader from the fledgling first century church and remove him to a prisoner colony like Alcatraz or something else like that? Why did they do that to him? Well, he tells us, he tells us right in verse 9, he says, I was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Why has John been banished? Is it that he failed to pay his taxes? No. Is it that he's got library fines that are due? No. Is it that he's got a bulb out on his chariot? No. The Roman Empire banished John to the island of Patmos for one reason and one reason only, and that is that the Apostle, Apostle John excuse me, would not stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wouldn't quit. And it's not as though we hadn't been warned, because John has been warned. John has been warned for decades and for years. Going all the way back to the book of Acts, chapter 4, uh, it was very early on, 
in the book of Acts, when John was warned by the authorities, he was warned by the Sanhedrin and the council in Acts chapter 4, it says, so they called them and they charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John, same John, our John, Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to listen to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak what we have seen or heard. And so from that point on, John is all in on gospel proclamation. He is all in. And whatever suffering that John is going to endure, right, it's not going to be because of overdue parking fines. John is willing to suffer and to die for the sake of the gospel because he is called to preach the gospel. Now let's just pause here and think reflectively just for a moment. Why is it, question, that it seems to be the case that whenever a totalitarian state rises in power, uh, there seems to be an inverse correlation between totalitarian authority on one hand and desire to suppress the gospel on the other hand. Why is that? You ever thought about that? Is that not true throughout church history? That when state power gets stronger, it always seems to be the case that persecution gets more severe? Don't be naive. I'll tell you why. I'll give you three reasons why. First, because gospel preaching frees minds. It does. Gospel preaching frees minds to think clearly and to see spiritual realities for what they are. When the gospel is preached, what happens is that men and women's and young people's minds tend to be freed. Freed from what? Freed from the relentless and, and nearly unceasing propaganda that is constantly being bombarded upon the citizens of any totalitarian authoritarian state. And the gospel frees minds from that. So you can see and you can think and you don't have to be constantly manipulated from the forces that are constantly trying to steer your affections elsewhere. The gospel frees minds. And you know what else it does? It unburdens consciences. And totalitarian states know that. And they don't like it. Because if there's one thing that, that statism tries to do, it is to try to manipulate people based on guilt and shame. They always do it. The people who've been freed by the gospel can't be manipulated because their, game and their, their shame and their guilt is gone. Right? You think back to the pandemic just for a moment. I'm not going to get too political, I promise. During any time in the pandemic, did you ever feel that somebody was trying to manipulate you based on shame or guilt? Yes? And freed consciences are not subject to that kind of manipulation because our guilt and our shame is already gone at the cross. Totalitarian states know that. And therefore, they want to suppress that kind of conscience-freeing power that the gospel has. Third reason. Gospel proclamation tends to cause us to have higher loyalties than the state itself. It does. And so when a person is saved by the gospel, whether it's a man or a woman or a teen or a child, what happens is they immediately and automatically begin to have a higher loyalty. It's the loyalty of the kingdom itself. That's why he says in verse 1, excuse me, in verse 9, our first verse, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and in the kingdom. John is a subject to a different, greater, higher kingdom. And gospelized people have higher loyalties than emperors and kings and governors and states and political parties. We refuse to be the mindless pawns on somebody else's geopolitical chessboard. Rome knew it, and they couldn't stand it. So they banished him to an island. Now let's go on to verse 10 here, and this is going to be something of a parenthesis in the message this morning, but I can't quite help but take note of this language here. Look at verse 10. John says, I was in the spirits on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. So I just want to linger over the phrase Lord's day for a moment, because I find this language to be very interesting. Um, 
So John was banished to an island, whether he was completely by himself or whether there are a few other Christians with him, I don't know. It could be that John is worshiping completely by himself. I don't know if he even had a Bible or even any scraps of of written scripture at all with him. I don't know if he had even one brother with him. At least Paul had Silas with him when he was beaten and flogged and put in the prison of Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And what did Paul and Silas do while they were in prison? They sang hymns to God, right? Remember this in the book of Acts? I don't know if John has anybody near him or with him. I don't know what he has beside him, whether he's got any scripture with him. All I know is this. John is worshiping on the Lord's day, just like you and I are doing right now. And so this imposed exile upon him could not quench that worshipful heart that John had for the Lord. And I find it interesting here that that Revelation uses the the, the phrase, the language of the Lord's day, because... It seems to be that very early on, I can't give you an exact year, but I'll tell you it was very early in the first century, that Christians began to use the first day of the week as their day of gathered worship and praise in the congregation. John continues to carry this on whether he's alone or not. Now, uh, you probably know that um, the Jews, they worshiped on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, and that the early Christians began to worship on the first day of the week, which took on this new phrase, the Lord's Day. My question to you quickly is, why is that? Why did early Christians begin to worship on the first day of the week rather than the seventh day of the week? Well, I'm going to give you a couple of answers here very quickly. A biblical answer, a theological answer, and then a very practical answer for why we continue to worship on the first day of the week and why we call it the Lord's Day. First answer is a biblical answer. Because of the resurrection appearances of Christ, the church began to worship on the first day of the week because that seems to be the day that Jesus met with his disciples after his resurrection. All right. So if you look at the resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, uh, very often when Jesus meets with his, with his disciples, if any day is specified at all, it's specified to be the first day of the week. Okay? Now, we know in the book of Acts that Jesus continued to meet with his disciples for teaching about the kingdom subsequent to the resurrection for 40 days before the ascension of Jesus. And we assume that Jesus continued to teach the disciples throughout those 40 days. All I'm merely observing to you is that if any day is particularly specified, it is the first day of the week. And so Christians seem to have very early begun to treasure Resurrection Day as a day in which they would gather together for their worship times and their times of preaching and their times of prayer. So that's the biblical reason for the shift to the first day, Lord's Day worship. Second reason is theological, because Christians very early began to connect the resurrection appearances of Jesus with a theology of the new creation. Okay, so thinking back to the seven days of of creation in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis chapter 1, it's on the first day of the week that God speaks out, let there be light, and the creation begins, right? And so Christians began to think about that theologically, and so as early as Justin Martyr, who's writing at the very beginning of the second century AD, Christians are already beginning to connect this idea that the resurrection is sort of like the hinge moment of all of redemption history in which this already not yet tension begins, in which we are now living in the new creation. And so theologically, Christians began meeting on the first day of the week and calling it the Lord's Day because the resurrection was so central in redemption history that it's as though God is creating all things new again. Okay, so we have a biblical reason a theological reason, and then there's a very practical reason too. Don't miss this in the book of Acts. It seems as though the Christians attempted very early on to worship with the Jews in the synagogues on the seventh day, Sabbath day, seventh day services. But what happened is as they began to preach the gospel of Jesus, what we notice then is is throughout the book of Acts that violence would seem to come to the synagogues every time they tried. And so quite practically, we would see the Christians showing up to the synagogues to worship and to praise God. They would preach the gospel of Jesus, and very often they would get beat and chased out of town for having done so. And so we see this pattern 
and Acts chapter 9, Acts 14, Acts 17, Acts 18. Every time Paul and the apostles, they show up, they try to preach the gospel. Very often, unfortunately, it ends in ugly violence, and so it wasn't very long before the Christians realized they simply were not able to worship in the same synagogues at the same time as the Jews, and so therefore they seem to have moved their worship over to the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, and by the time Paul is writing to the Corinthians in chapter 16 of 1 Corinthians, he's already assuming that that's their regular pattern of worship, And he says, whenever you meet on the first day of the week, Corinthians, make sure to set apart your tithes and your offerings, just as the Galatians are already doing. So what we can say is that the shift from seventh day to first day worship happened as early as the early 50s. It seems to have happened very early, though we can't quite point to a specific date. Yet John seems to evidence here this first day resurrection, new creation style of worship that he refuses to cease participating in even if they remove him to banishment by way of exile okay so so john is writing now as one who is experiencing himself these tribulations that the church is always going to experience because whenever we're preaching the gospel faithfully we should expect to receive hardship for doing so okay that makes sense so far all right So let's transition that into what John begins to see in his vision. And the the vision uh, begins properly in verse 11, where it says this, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. So John initially begins to hear something, a voice. And he says it's so commanding that it's like a trumpet in verse 10. And the trumpet, the sounding voice instructs him to write down what he's about to see in a book. And he's going to then send it to these seven churches. Now, if you look at a map, and we don't have time to do that this morning, uh, the island of Patmos was closest to the mainland. The closest city would have been Ephesus. And so what we see here is these churches listed in sort of a clockwise order, if you look at a map geographically, from Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum, and then turning back to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. We don't know a lot about these early churches. What I can tell you is that Paul planted the church of Ephesus, and we know the church of Thyatira, or at least we've heard of it because Lydia comes from there. Laodicea has some connection with the Colossian church because Paul tells them to exchange letters in Colossians chapter 4. And so what it looks like is that the early church planting efforts in Asia Minor have been extraordinarily successful so that planted churches are now planting other churches. And so the gospel is moving at sort of this unstoppable way and and John is now instructed then to share what he sees by way of circular letter first to Ephesus, and then it's going to be passed around clockwise in geographical order all the way around so that the letter is corresponded then to all of the churches in Asia Minor. And what does he see in verse 12? Here here comes the first thing that he sees with his eyes. You ready? Then I turned to see the voice. Now that's kind of an interesting turn of phrase, isn't it? You don't see voices, but nevertheless. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me And on turning, the first thing he sees is seven golden lampstands. Now, what is the deal with that? What are the lampstands? Well, this is one of the easiest symbols in the entire book of Revelation because it actually tells us what they are. We don't have to work hard here. It tells us in verse 20, if you skip to chapter 1, verse 20, we're told explicitly what the seven lampstands are. Look at the latter half of verse 20. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. All right, so pretty short A to B connection here. (laughs) What are the lampstands? Seven churches. Told that explicitly. Now, that doesn't mean that our homework is over, though, because John is actually drawing this language from the prophecy of Zechariah. We're not going to have time to work through this, but I just want to mention to you that in Zechariah chapter 4, which is also an apocalyptic-style book, uh, 
Zechariah also sees seven lampstands, okay? So this vision has been seen before. And in Zechariah's prophecy, when Zechariah asks for the meaning of what the lampstands are, the one who is revealing this to Zechariah says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? Okay? So we might think then that the seven lampstands are the seven churches, especially as they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do what? Well, what do lampstands do? They shine. Exactly. Lampstands are built for one purpose, and that is to shine. Let's pause here and just think of some application just for a moment. So if, if we are designed to shine lights, that already sort of presupposes that, that much of the world is darkness. And it's our mission to bring light to it. Like you recognize this, right? That the world is a dark place? Yes? Any surprises here? You don't expect to find light coming from the media, do you? You don't expect to find light coming from Hollywood, do you? They exist primarily to pacify your soul and to dull your senses, not to illuminate them. We don't expect to find illumination and light coming from secular philosophy. We don't expect to see light coming from the universities, though many of them were at one time designed as training colleges, Christian colleges, and seminaries to further the light, yet many of them have now turned their backs on their original constitution. So what we see when we turn left What we see when we turn right, when we look forward, when we look back in this world, most of the time what we see is darkness. And it's whose job then, Gospel Fellowship, to bring the light to the world? It's ours, as we are illuminated and empowered by the Holy Spirit, not by might, but by the Spirit, saith the Lord to Zerubbabel. Okay? So that, so that means, by implication, that we, Gospel Fellowship, we have a particular mission to light up our community with the gospel. And we, we can never be distracted from that. Never distracted. We may do many things, and we may do many things well, but the one thing we'd better do well is shine the light of the gospel. That's why we're here. Okay. We've got volleyball leagues. I have no problem with that. We've got angle ball. I've got no problem with that. We've got quilting groups. I've got no problem with that. We've got all kinds of groups, ministries, clubs. We have studies for various ages. Uh, We're sending people to to different places in the world, as you've already heard this morning. I only ask one thing of us, that we stay centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ and that absolutely everything we do serve to further our light as beacons of hope in a very dark world. Stay focused on that. That's our mission. That's why we're here. And I also want to point out that these lampstands are themselves golden lampstands not plastic they're not wood not clay they're not straw they're golden lampstands which means that they are precious precious to who you ask glad you asked let's go on to the next verse Verse 13, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. So now John sees not only these seven glowing bright lampstands in which gospel hope is being emitted out into the darkness of the unbelieving world, but now what John sees is the one, the one who stands in the midst of his lampstands. The one who stands as he who brings light to the lampstands. The one who stands curating and tending and caring for the lampstands. Who does John see here in this vision, verse 13? Who is it? It's the Son of Man. Now tonight, in the evening service, I do want you to come back, whether we're in the pavilion or whether we're here in the sanctuary, because... David is going to actually teach a pretty important message to us tonight from Daniel's vision in chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, 
Uh, David is going to help explain to us tonight the Son of Man vision of Daniel, which John is constantly going to refer to throughout the book of Revelation. Very important prophecy from Daniel 7. Please come back to the evening service tonight and hear that exposited to you. Okay? But we're running out of time, and we're going to go to the Lord's Supper here in just a moment. But I do want to point out just a couple of details here in this theophany that John sees. A theophany is a, is a, va- a visible manifestation of God's holy presence. Though we cannot see him fully with the eye, yet John is going to describe him as though we can. And what is the language that John uses here? Let me just pick a couple of details for the sake of time. First, notice his hair is white. Okay. This actually comes from the Son of Man prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. Ironically, though, it's the Ancient of Days who has the white hair. And so probably what John is doing here is he's acknowledging that the Son of Man has the same nature, the same divine nature as the Ancient of Days does. And so just as God the Father is wise and eternal and glorious, so also the Son of God is wise and eternal and glorious. And notice too here that the eyes of the Son of Man here, they are glowing like flames of fire. Now John is combining in this theophany vision here uh, elements of Daniel 7, Daniel 10, and Ezekiel chapter 1. These are all other theophanies in the Old Testament. Uh, John is sort of combining some of the features here. In all of these theophanies, there is an element of fire or brightness or glowing And so John now describes the eyes of Christ as glowing like fire. What does that mean? It means he is intensely holy. Sometimes you look at somebody's eyes and you see fear. Sometimes you look at someone's eyes and you see pride. Sometimes you look at someone's eyes and you see humility or meekness. When you look into the eyes of Jesus Christ, if you dare to do so, you will see holy, glowing fire. And notice then immediately, what does John do next? He goes straight from the eyes, where? Down to the feet. He's got to turn his face away. He can't look long. And so then John begins to describe his feet, and they are described as as burnished bronze, like they are refined in a furnace. This is battle language here, because bronze is a battle-ready metal. It's not a soft metal. It's not a precious metal like gold or silver. This is is warlike language here. We're going to see Christ the victor, Christ who conquers. We're going to see Christ who, like Psalm 2 says, dashes to pieces like a potter's vessel his enemies who do not submit to him. And then John says that he heard his voice like the roar of many waters. Now, waters, as we just saw with Hurricane Ian, can be ferocious. Yes? But this may be especially relevant to John, who, as you recall, is banished to an island. Right? Don't forget that. He's banished to an island. And so if you've ever been to the beach before, the one thing you know is that the waters are constant. They are abiding. They're sometimes very comforting. Sometimes they're very assuring. And so in this language here of the voice being like many waters, there is both connoted here power as well as comfort to his people. And so I know we're going to do more with this uh, next week and we're out of time for today. Uh, But what John sees here is not the baby in the manger. What John sees here is not uh, Jesus agonizing in Gethsemane. What John sees here is not Christ being kicked and punched and hit and spat upon in Pilate's court. What, What John sees here is not the limp, dead body of Jesus being hoisted down from the cross, as Joseph of Arimathea might have seen. What John sees here is the resurrected and exalted Lord, glorious Jesus Christ. And the only thing that John can do now is fall down like he's dead. And we're going to talk more about that next week. Church, let's grab our hymnals out. We're going to turn to our our next hymn and we're going to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. Elders, if you'll please join us at the table.